Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again. So very grateful, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to just feast upon your word, your precious word, that which transforms our lives and draws us ever near, ever closer to you in our walk by grace, walking in the works that, that you have prepared before us that we should walk in. We give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. I only ask that you would filter out all that which is not of you, but just seal to our hearts truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in the uh, second chapter of Titus, Paul's epistle to Titus chapter 2. And I want you to take note of something right, right here up front, here before we get started, that in the King James Version, what I often refer to as the authorized version, we see highlighted uh, these different sections. We see it highlighted teaching sound doctrine and God's grace brings salvation. Now, I find that amazing that, that it's right there headlined in the King James Version, the importance of sound doctrine, which is not popular today, and that God's grace brings salvation. Law doesn't save us. We're not saved or delivered by law. Salvation, that is the word sozo, deliverance, not redemption, but God's grace brings deliverance. It is God's grace that delivers us. And that through sound doctrine, and we see that highlighted right here in the authorized version. And I guess it just astounds me, folks, how that Christians today, the church as a whole today, is not all that interested in either one of these headlines. So I wanted to point that out as we begin to to move forward uh, through to the end of chapter 2. We're about to wrap up chapter 2. But before we get into the last few verses of this uh, amazing chapter, I want to point out something else. We see the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you look at uh, verses 19 and 20, the context there is a body context. By that I mean the church. Not an individual, personal context, but a body context, which I believe is relevant to our present study. So I want to quickly address that. If you look at verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God with your body. And I don't know how many Christians that I've met over the years who think that's talking about their flesh and bones. They think that's talking about the individual believer. Your body, you know, this body right here, this, this body. Hope I didn't knock my mic off like I did uh uh, in, a, in a recent video where I had to, to, to jack the volume up just to salvage the video. Folks, it's a, it's a body context. Nothing comes out more clear uh, to prove that than just simply taking note of the singular versus the plural in the text. Now, I, I, may, I know it may seem like I'm slaughtering a sacred cow here, another sacred cow, which I tend to do a lot. I don't really mean to do that. If you've taken this as your individual body um, all your life, you know, I'm not going to fault you for that. But I, it is my responsibility to point out to you what the text says. You know, this is not my opinion. This is simply what the text says. Even the King James, 
gets the headline correct. Uh, or in the, the Berean Bible, the, the Berean Study Bible gets, gets it correct. The temple, not a temple. Now, uh, I suppose the, the diff there's not much difference really in the word the and a. It's still, it's talking about one temple. It's not talking about us as a bunch of temples running around all over the place. Okay? It, it is vital that we give heed to grammar. Okay, distinguishing between the singular and the plural. In fact, uh, I wish that I could take the time sometime just to go over with you how that I, I go through the text, it, taking note of the difference between verbs and nouns, uh, looking at the conjunctions, looking at the prepositions, you know, looking at the, the tenses, you know, present tense, perfect tense, aorist tense, all of these things looking at the context, which is extremely important. You know, I, I've never really done a video on how to study. And folks, it's really not rocket science. It, it really is. You don't, I don't think any one of us has to go to Bible school to learn how to study. If we just slow down and instead of just reading through it, you know, like we'd read a, a Louis L'Amour Western, you know, this is God's Word. Just go slow, take note of each word. You know, when, when I teach these verse-by-verse -verse videos, it's, I really often, I don't have the time to go word word-by-word. Word. It's verse-by-verse. Verse. But in a sense, when I'm, when I'm doing verse-by-verse, verse, I am going through the text word-by-word, word. at least to, to the extent that I always take note of those words and the grammar which brings out the full flavor or the meaning of the text. This is extremely important, folks, because we are handling God's Word. And we don't want to do that deceitfully. The temple, not a temple. So it's vital that we give heed to grammar. And it's important that we, in, in this particular chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, in talking about the temple, the body being the temple, that we take note of the singular versus the plural. Know ye not that your body is the temple. That's body of Christ, not physical body. Body is the temple, not a temple. We are members. All of us are individual members of that one body. So we're looking at in this present context here in Corinthians, it's the body of, of Christ at Corinth. It's the Corinthians. Okay? And I want you to take note of the fact that that is what is being commanded and that and is, and is an imperative there, okay, in the grammar. Uh, it's the mood of command. That is, that's what's being commanded to glorify God. Do you Corinthians not all know, and that's plural, that the singular body of you, now he switches to the singular, of you all, the singular body of you all, now he switches back to plural, is a single temple. He switches back to singular again. The text couldn't be more clear. Therefore, we glorify God in our body. So how does the singular body, of which we are all members, the, the, the church, how does it glorify Him? Because we're commanded to glorify Him. Well, I believe the text tells us there, knowing that we were bought with a price. Okay? Now, that's redemption. Okay? And it, it, that redemption is, is something that we had no part in. Okay, so I don't see a problem there glorifying God. We're being commanded to glorify Him in our body, and this in relationship to redemption in which we had no part in. No wonder we are able, God has enabled us, to glorify Him. 
it's kind of hard to glorify God when we think that we have redeemed ourselves or, or, we've, or God has redeemed us based upon something that we ourselves did. So, though I, though I believe the two are related, I don't believe God is, is near as much concerned about us individually as He is us corporately, the body of Christ, the ministry of the body, okay? Uh, th that may sound somewhat odd to, for you to hear me say that, but no, I don't think God is concerned as much about us as He is the ministry. I mean, we stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. You know, uh, the ministry of the body. You know, in the business world, a corporation is only as good as its employees. You know, we are righteous, holy. We stand before Him without spot or blemish. We've been fully forgiven, forgiven all of our trespasses. We are to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God, Romans 6, 11. The new man is sinless. He cannot sin because his seed abides in us, and so we cannot sin. But we can sin against the body, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality, and I do not believe that's talking about pornography or whatever. I believe there may be a secondary application, but it is the sexual immorality. It is, it is spiritual fornication. That is, being married to Christ or a spouse to Christ, yet having an endless, flirtatious affair with the law. That's how we commit spiritual adultery. We are to flee from that. And the text says, every other sin a man can commit is outside his body, but he who sins in this, in this sense of sexual immorality, he sins against his own body. Every sin a man can commit is outside his body, but he who sins in this way sins against his own body. Now, looking at our present study in Titus, in which case the epistle to Titus also concerns itself with a body context. Titus was sent to, to appoint elders. The whole, everything that we've been looking at since we, almost since we began this study is in the direction of the ministry and how Titus is to establish the ministry and conduct the ministry. Ministry, that is sound doctrine, Looking for that blessed hope. And, you know, I pointed out in my last video the construction of the grammatical, uh, the, the sentence structure in the original text is literally not what we originally might have thought that it was. It's not His glorious appearing, but the appearance of His glory. That is our present hope, the appearance of His glory and that in our body, that is the body of Christ. Because we're looking at the appearance of His glory. Chapter 2, verse 14. This is where I, I want to quickly go over this. I know I touched on it. Who gave Himself for us, says the text, folks. He didn't give Himself for everybody. Folks, if you don't see this as a love letter written to you, a member of His body, the church, if you see this as an open-ended book or invitation to, to uh, wheat and tare alike or sheep and goats alike, then I, I don't think you really understand this book. Who gave himself for us. That's substitutionary death. Not provisionary, not conditional. He died in our place. And here's, here's why. In order that, and that's a henna clause, in the, in the original text, the, the, the word that in your, in, your te, in, you, in, in your Bibles, the word that in the original text is what we call a purpose clause. In order that, 
This is why he gave himself for us, in order that he might redeem. That is, and I, and I pointed out, redemption is buying back, back what was previously your own possession. Okay? It wasn't, it's not buying something, you go to a flea market, you see something there that you buy, you want and you buy it and you take it home, you've never had it before. That's, that's not, you know, that's not the word redemption. The word redemption is, is some, someone took something of yours, you lost something that previously belonged to you, and then you purchased it back. It's, that's why we call it ransom, redemption, ransom. He paid the price. We know that price was his blood. He purchased back what was his. We were all always his. We were always his. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That he might redeem us, that is, purchase back what was his from all iniquity. Now, the word iniquity is, is the word, uh, you've got the word law, and then you've got the, the ah, uh, in f the negative in front of law, it's no law. And it's where we get our word antinomian. No law. To redeem us from all of that which is of antinomian in the sense of no law. But don't get confused. We're not under law. We're under grace. It's We're looking at God's commandments. Okay? We were not following God's commandments. And He redeemed us from that. Now we are. We keep His commandments. We guard His commandments. The word keep that John uses in keeping His commandments, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's guard. The word there is tereo in the Greek. It means guard. We do keep His commandments. We didn't before, but now we do. And so many are concerned about the forgiveness of sin when, it, when the text says that He redeemed us from all iniquity. That's all. All. The sin issue has been settled, and it's been settled forever, folks. Our sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea, remembered no more. But it goes on. The text goes on and says, and purify. So you have an and. That's, that's a connecting uh, conjunction there. And purify. Now, we are pure. We know that. We are pure. He who has this hope within himself purifies himself even as he is pure. The new man cannot sin. The new man, we are pure. We stand before him wholly unblameable and unreprovable. So one of the reasons why he died was to purify, okay, unto himself. He did that. It's done. You don't have to work to try to make yourself pure. Unto himself a peculiar people. That is a very odd, a strange phrase, peculiar. You'll never see that anywhere else. It's very, spe even the phrase is special. The word means precious. It means special. That he would redeem unto himself a special, precious people. That's what the text is saying. Zealous. That is enthusiastic, fanatical. Zealous of good works. Just like the religious Pharisees of Jesus' time were zealots. And, and don't let the word zealous throw you either because it's not a verb showing action. It is a noun. If you look in all of you Greek people out there, students, if you look at the, at the word, it's, it's a noun. We're zealots. Okay? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a special precious people zealots zealots of good works 
Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I've never met. I don't think I've ever met a Christian who was living under law, burdened by the law, had that heavy yoke of law around their neck, living day by day, trying to keep the law, who was ever zealot, a zealot about that. Of course, we know from history, we know that th those that Jesus stood, that, uh, that those that opposed Je our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who were considered zealots, the Pharisees, they were zealots according to the law. Well, we are also zealots, but we're not under the law. And the text, folks, is saying that it's, it says a precious people zealous of good works. Yeah, but wait a minute, Steve. I, I, thought, I thought we're not under law. We're not. We're not. And that's and I, so I want to focus on that phrase good works. I believe it's saying that those living under the law, the uh, law keeping is a rule of life, they fail to realize that his death for them, their their redemption, the very purpose that he died in, in their place for them, they, they fail to realize it was so that that they would not live according to the flesh. Yet here we say we're zealous for, we're a special, precious people zealous for good works. Bear with me. I'm doing my best here with this. This is, this is a, little, a little complicated even for me because, because the, the complication on my part, on my end, folks, is, is that I won't present this in a way that it confuses you even more. I have, my, I have a great concern that I won't, I won't make matters worse by confusing anyone here. Their works, walking according to the flesh, walking according to the law. Now that's how most people would 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 read this. Uh, there are countless numbers. I don't think you could count them all of Christians who would think that this what this passage is saying is that he he died for us in order that we would really try to keep the law here. And folks, that's not what the text is saying at all. Now, might redeem. Uh, I've had, I had a question on that. Uh, thank God for questions. And if you think you don't help me, well, you, you help me tremendously when you ask a question because I, you may very well point out where I erred. And in fact, I did in my last video. So I need to somewhat try to redeem myself here concerning the might, the word might. Because I've always been inclined to look at the subjunctive mood, you know, might, maybe, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't, maybe this will happen, maybe it won't, as I've taken the subjunctive for the most part, usually, normally, in most cases, as the mood of uncertainty which it, it definitely does express, the mood of uncertainty. But there's a rule in the grammar in which there are times in which it does not express the mood of uncertainty. Might redeem. Well, it's an aorist. He did that in that he died unto sin once. He's not, he's not dying again. He's not going to die again. This is what we, we the writer of uh, to the, uh, in the book of Hebrews, really pushes hard on that point that he's not coming to die again. A finished transaction. And so it is a subjunctive which, which sometimes expresses the mood of uncertainty. But, but, and here it is, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this as slowly and softly, I'll tread through this as softly as I can so that, that you can understand what this is saying. If the subjunctive mood, and, and I'm talking about this in relationship to the word might, in order that he might redeem, you know, which tends to leave you with the impression, well, maybe he won't redeem us. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. That's not what the text is saying. If the subjunctive mood is used in a 
purpose clause or a result clause, which, which it is in this case, in order that, the text says, then the rule of grammar requires uh, it, the rule of grammar actually requires that there be a subjunctive there, that there that it be that it be a, a subjunctive, because there's a purpose clause. So, so in the Greek, and I don't know about the English, but in the Greek, there has to be uh, it has to be in the subjunctive mood, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it expresses uncertainty. The action should not be thought of as a possible result, but should be viewed as a definite outcome that will happen as a result of another stated action in which, in, in this case, in which is him dying in our place, our being redeemed. Therefore, in Titus 2, verse 14, since the word that is a purpose clause, it's a henna clause, what we call a henna clause, in order that, then the word might is not, not to be viewed as a matter of uncertainty, but certainty. And I hope I ex explained that well enough for you folks to understand. It's not showing any uncertainty here at all. It would be kind of like me saying, well, I spent all this money on this truck so that I might drive it to town. Just because I use the word might doesn't mean that, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm going to drive it to town, maybe I'm not. If, if that helps, if that helps uh, you understand that at all. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, which he did, and purify unto himself, which he did. That's what the text is saying. A peculiar, special, precious, people, peculiar, meaning of surpassing value. It, what it does, the word describes believers, folks, it, it, the word describes Christians who belong to the Lord as his prized possession, his, his prized treasure, special possession, zealous of good works, his works, his works, his works. Now, how do I know that? Oh, Steve, you're just making that up. You, you want it to be his works, so you're just going to say it's his works. When it just says, you know, zealous of good works. And so bear with me here, and I'll try to muddle my way through this. We are not people, folks, that are zealous of human activity. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. In verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should, should boast. Verse 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And I want you to take note of, of the, that epsilon nu in the Greek. In. In, folks, is a preposition of rest. Epsilon Nu says, I didn't have anything to do with the, with the creation. We, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. We didn't have anything to do with that. Unto good works, the word is unto, uh, it, it's actually, and that, that's what, how it should read in your Bible, the word in the Greek, folks, is epi. It, the word is upon. Okay? That's the word. And you can't make this stuff up. I, I, don't, I don't make stuff up. I'm just, get, I'm just telling you what it says. Created in Christ Jesus. Okay? Upon good works. Big difference. Okay? In unto and upon at least in my opinion. That is, so in is a place of rest. It's a preposition of rest upon good works. So we are resting upon good works. Wh whose works? Ours? No. 
which God hath before ordained. That is prepared beforehand. Okay? That we should walk in them. That's what the text is. So I have every right here in Titus 2.14 to say that this is not our works that we're zealous for, that we're fanatical for, over, okay? That we're just so super excited over. Law doesn't do that, folks. Law does, do, is, does not make you zealous of, of you know, I pl I've already pointed that out. Fleshly, carnal, natural works of the old man trying to clean up the flesh trying to please god living on, you know i'm trying to live under god under a system that's based on human merit i've never met anybody zealous for that i mean they may they may appear at times on the surface to be but i guarantee you that yoke folks is heavy okay even those who are living under the law know that they don't keep the law, that they are unable to keep the law. It's not our works that we walk in. It's His. Which God has before ordained, prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Verse 15, these things, what things? The things that we just read. Speak and exhort. Exhort, the word means to walk along. It's, it's the same word used of the Holy Spirit comforting us, parakaleo, walk alongside comfort. That is, so speak and comfort and rebuke that is show to be guilty with all authority let no man despise thee and the word despise despise being more concerned about how 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 one looks or, or who they are than what they teach if, if you're being despised if i'm being despised okay the text says let no man despise thee Paul is, is saying this to Titus. The personal application as far as you and I are concerned. If someone despises us, they are more concerned about how we look, who we are, reputation, whatever, than what we're teaching. It's The word uh, denotes ha overthinking, personal bias. It's, it, it, has the, it carries the idea of, well, who do you think you are? You know, that kind of thing, which I've heard on, on more than one occasion. It means to examine on all sides. It shows little concern for the authority of what is being said, that is the word, doctrine, sound, healthy teaching. showing great concern for the personality of the one which is saying it, or lack of lack thereof, lack of personality. Titus 1.15, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And we read in 1 John 3.3, 3, Turn to it in your Bible. Don't just take my word for it. 1 John 3.3 3, Every man that hath this hope in him purify, purifieth himself even as he is pure. That's in 1 John. The same writer that's, that, that tells us that the new man cannot sin because we've been born of God. His seed abides in us and therefore we cannot sin. We can't sin. No wonder Paul says in Romans chapter 7, it is not I that sins, but sin which dwells in me. How can he do that? Because Paul understands he's not a single-natured individual, but a dual-natured individual. 
one in whom God has not taken and eradicated the old man, but made him a new creation, were that he has a new man that is sinless, that cannot sin. And God has nothing to do with the old man. He has nothing to do with the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. God is not trying to clean up the old man. So in a body context here, okay, Titus is being told, he's being told, let no man despise thee. I can read into that, uh, and I don't think, you know, in reading between the lines, I don't know exactly how old Titus was, but I'm sure that there may have been older men in the fellowship that thought, well, you know, this young kid here, you know, he's, he's not going to be telling me, you know, which end is up. Let no man despise thee. Zealous of good works. Now, if you turn to Matthew chapter 7, I'd like to talk about something else there too. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, uh, I believe around verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. The word good is kalos. Okay? But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. All right? Porneros, that's that's a awful sounding word, but that's a different word. Evil. Porna porne. Porn the word there is is uh porneros. It's not kalus for good. Now in our present text, zealous of good works, kalos. That's what, we, that's what we're looking at. Okay? Matthew 7, every good tree bringeth forth kalos fruit. We are zealous of kalos works, good works. In Matthew 7, 17, a good tree bringeth forth kalos fruit. Same word. Okay? New man. New man. I believe, you know, we're seeing there in Matthew 7, 17, with the good tree and the bad tree, good tree brings forth good fruit, bad tree brings forth evil fruit. We're looking at a picture of the old and the new man. Now, if you turn over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident, that is absolutely confident. It, it's, it is a perfect tense of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. Doesn't say might perform it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now that's despite how it might appear to you in your life. Folks, when he has tested us, we shall come forth as gold. He began it. He will complete it. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Okay? So again, there in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He which hath begun a good work in you. What work is that? His works. The perfect finished work of Christ. That It is that, that which we are to walk in. Now, if you go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, uh, or start at verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, verse 10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in, bearing fruit in, that is, resting in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining 
of the glory of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Stand fast. Now, folks, to me that means, that also means rest. Our resting in His works. And hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation, and li listen, good hope through grace. Verse 17, comfort your hearts and, and establish you in, there's that, there's that word in again, preposition of rest, establish you in every good word and work. Now you contrast that with uh, here in Titus, chapter 1 in Titus, verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable and disobedient and unto, the word there is toward, pros in the Greek, toward every good work, reprobate. And I pointed out even the plowing and even the worship of the wicked is sin. They do good works as far as natural works, fleshly works, natural works are concerned. But what makes works good? What is it that makes our works good and acceptable to God? Folks, the intrinsic value of, of, of those works is defined by the motive behind them. Zealous of good works is, is talking about Christ's finished work. The, the, the chapter ends with Paul telling Titus, let no man despise thee in regard to the sound, healthy teaching that, that you are instructing them on concerning and, and ending with our good, our good works being Christ's finished work. And that's where we're going to end chapter 2. We'll pick up with uh, chapter 3, the next video. Uh, I would have had this video up yesterday, but we had a storm and I had to clean up after the storm. I want to thank you all that, for your prayers, especially those who prayed with us through this storm. Uh, we came out okay. Minor damage. Uh, I want to thank you all for praying for this ministry. I ask for your prayers, your ongoing continued prayers for this ministry. I want to thank all of you for all of your questions that helped me, all of your messages, all of your feedback, all of your support. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.